Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Minnesota leads the Midwest in clean energy job growth and more innovations are underway. This week we hear from state officials who are partnering with international leaders to advance renewable energy technology. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program, I'm Shannon Lurkey. The University of Minnesota Institute on the Environment regularly partners with the German government to initiate exchanges with Minnesota stakeholders in an effort to collaboratively explore innovations in energy policy. Joining me in the studio to talk more about the goals of those international partnerships is the program's director, Dr. Sabina Engel, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having the University of Minnesota um, be able to explain to your viewers what we've been up to. So we're, we're very happy to have you. I just, I'd like to start with my first question, which is that you and a handful of Minnesota lawmakers just returned from a recent trip to Germany as part of one of these renewable energy exchanges. Why Germany? How did this partnership come to be? The most important thing to know about this exchange and why it makes sense has to do with how government is structured. Who's responsible for energy policy in the US and also in Germany? Well, in Germany, it's clear. It's the federal government in Germany that is responsible for this. In the US, the picture is much more different. So in the US, it's actually the states that are individually responsible for their energy policy. And when it adds up, when different states come together and do similar things, then you might progress to a national energy policy. But well, in the US, we don't have that national energy policy yet. But we have plenty of states that are pretty far advanced with their state energy policy. And Minnesota is one of the leaders because Minnesota um, actually has an advantage by not having a particular type of resource. We don't have natural gas here, we don't have coal, we don't have oil. So for renewable energy... So we don't energy, have these things that other, other parts of the country fall back on automatically. We need other innovations in order to move forward, is that right? Correct, yes. And in 2007, the legislature was uh, um, looking f into the future and decided we want to invest in renewable energy and see if we could keep a, a big portion of the funds that we otherwise would use in order to buy fossil fuels in the state and use that money for other things. So renewable energy got developed, and uh, Germany um, is the country in the world that actually created a market for renewable energy. Before the Germans went in that direction, nobody thought that renewable energy was feasible, that it was uh, economical, that it had a future. That is the big accomplishment of uh, Germans and Germany, the taxpayers, for having put so much funding into developing this technology that today renewable energy is com price competitive with all other energy sources. And that's why these leaders who made Minnesota go in this direction already in 2007 had a great opportunity to connect with leaders in Germany on precisely these issues. And so the German government then has partnered, partnered with Minnesota. What is it then that the stakeholders, the lawmakers and others from our state who go to Germany on these exchanges, what is it that they glean from this firsthand experience? We've been doing this at the University of Minnesota since 2011. And in 2011, your viewers will remember that uh, the nuclear accident in Fukushima happened. It created a, a big mm -hmm. crisis in Germany's energy policy because it um, created a situation where 90% of Germans said, we want to exit nuclear power. We want to go to a safer source of energy. We want to go into a future that is all renewable. How do we do this? So since 2011, since the official um, government policy became, we want to go to 80% renewables in our grid by 2050, we have had an opportunity with these delegations to follow each step of this uh, process. Mm -hmm. The energy transition is a big undertaking. It's not only about uh, renewable energy in the electricity grid. It's um, something that the Germans now call energy transition 2.0. What okay. does 2.0 mean? 2.0 means one needs to talk about efficiency, increase efficiency uh, enormously, uh, think about how to electrify transportation, mm -hmm. how to reduce the footprint of buildings, and uh, how to put a lot more renewable energy onto the grid. Storage is important, 
you know, all of these things together are really important because what's behind this thinking is uh, nobody wants to live differently. We just need our energy supply right. to be provided differently. So what is the significance of this uh, uh, wind turbine that you've brought I today? I brought a little prop here. It's uh, a wind turbine. It uh, is the University of Minnesota's wind turbine model mm -hmm. at the Morris campus. The university, obviously, as a big research institution, mm -hmm. is uh, instrumental to developing some of the technologies that we will need in order to have this clean energy future. So there are a couple of wind turbines at the University of Minnesota Morris campus, and we just found out because uh, the city of Morris and some German cities together are exchanging notes on you know, how their energy transition is going, mm -hmm. that uh, the Morris wind turbine has twice the yield as a uh, larger wind turbine in the city of Zabek, with, with which the city of Morris is partnered. Well, so the, and the University of Minnesota Morris is actually one of the university campuses that is pushing hardest towards renewables, is that right? That is correct. So at, um, you asked earlier why people are going to Germany. Mm -hmm. I mean, essentially, you can see the future, you can see the energy transition as it evolves. You need living laboratories in order to find out you know, what are the issues, how do we resolve the issues. The campus at the University of Minnesota Morris is a big laboratory. Mm -hmm. It is our sustainability campus. And we have an opportunity through our researchers to deploy some of the latest technology there and to find out whether it's actually workable. Is it, uh, does it do what we hope for it to do? Mm -hmm. does it, uh, is it affordable? Could we imagine a way to make it affordable? One of our um, researchers, and we don't have this at the um, University of Minnesota Morris campus, is Dr. David Pui. What he has done is he has put a prototype in one of the largest cities in China. It's essentially a huge air purifier. It's 200 feet tall, and it sucks up um, CO2 mm -hmm. and um, cleans it up and uh, takes out particles that are precisely the particles that uh, make our children suffer from asthma. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of innovation. And what we've seen in the German um, trips is that the places that are partnered with research um, institutions, mm -hmm. cities, regardless of what size, mm -hmm. they do really well by practicing solutions, by figuring out what might be the solution for this particular issue. For example, just now with this delegation, we were in a small village in Bavaria, bucolic. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are a laboratory for figuring out how at the distribution level, so the, the, the wires that come into our homes, how can we put a lot of renewable energy on that um, grid and how can we um, make it totally self-sufficient? And in the moments that it's not self-sufficient, how do we connect it so that the lights don't go out? One final question for you. Bloomberg reported just uh, last month, actually, that Germany's wind and solar farms surpassed coal as a source of electricity for the first time ever. So how far behind is the U.S. and Minnesota? Because presumably with these partnerships, that's the direction that we're going. How far behind are we? No, you can ask the question as, as how far behind are we. I like to formulate the question differently because the uh, energy policy is made at the state level. Mm -hmm. So we are, at, we are doing really well because we do not have fossil fuels in Minnesota. We have 26% of our electricity come from renewable energy right now, as opposed to, as compared to Germany's 36.5%. Mm -hmm. um, our adoption rate is faster than Germany's was. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to build on what the Germans needed to try first we can benefit from that. And that's what these uh, the exchanges are all about. We want to benefit from the insights in Germany, from their solutions. And what I'm hoping is that the legislators and the other members and the delegation, because it's so collaborative an mm -hmm. effort, come back with the sense we can do this together. Dr. Engel, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me.
Senator David Sengem has been a frequent participant of the Germany-Minnesota energy policy exchanges. He is one of several lawmakers who visited that country this summer and now joins me in the studio to discuss his takeaways from this latest trip. Welcome. It's good to be here, Shannon. So you've been on a handful of these international trips so far in your legislative career. How, how do your experiences translate into policy? I think uh, in, in several, and in, not necessarily about me or anything like that. I mean, we talk about community solar gardens, where that come from, where it came from, uh, came from uh, as outgrowth of these, uh, these particular trips. But I think moreover, what we do is uh, we go over there, uh, we come back, and we talk about it. And I think we're, we need to be in this talking about it stage at, at this point before you certainly advance to policy. You can't let policy get ahead of, of mood, so to speak. So we're, uh, we do that. Our delegation comes back and we'll do various uh, programs. Uh, University of Minnesota, we'll do some in Rochester, uh, other places around the state. And so uh, we just want to talk about this from the standpoint of uh, what we've seen and what we think the future may be. Uh, based on what we've seen. So uh, that's what we do, and uh, I think it's translating pretty well. Uh, a lot of people that come to our programs, uh, I think, go away appreciating that, uh, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe this is something we need to think about. I read that this year's focus was on rural communities, um, roles as well as the rural-urban partnerships necessary for transitioning to a clean energy economy. What does Germany do well with their rural and rural-urban partnerships that Minnesota could learn from? I, they, they, they have a, they, they've got some wonderful cities. Saarbeck has been mentioned by Dr. Dr. Engel, this, this small city in Bavaria that we visited this year. I don't remember the name. It would be too long and too German for me to pronounce. But, <laughs> but they, uh, they, they do absolutely wonderful things. Uh, examples, the, the small city in Bavaria, for instance, actually generates five times the electricity they need, and so they export it into the, into the system. Uh, the same with the Sarbach. Uh, they, they generate much more than they need to export it. And, and these are cities that can actually stand alone. They don't need the rest of the world, if you will, to electrify them. And uh, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. But but that's, that's an example of what we see over there. Uh, so nothing. these rural communities are creating more energy than they need and actually then exporting it elsewhere. Exactly, exactly. Uh, another example of what we saw, which was just fascinating uh, to me, you know, city of Munich, 1.4 million people. You know, it's pretty big. Uh, uh, they get their uh, district heating water, hot water, to heat their downtown district, large city, uh, by drilling down about two miles into the earth, pulling out 140 degrees centigrade water, and distribute, you know, using it then through through the, the piping system to, to warm their city, uh, totally renewable from the standpoint of there's no fossil fuel or anything involved there. So we see these kind of things, and they're they're fascinating, and they're certainly idea prompters. And so you come back here, and you've obviously you feel inspired. You have conversations with other lawmakers, with the residents of Minnesota, and start a conversation about could we do this here? Absolutely, yeah. And Dr. Ingle has uh, this other program called Climate Smart Municipalities, uh, which uh, have actually partnered up with five different individual city uh, pro, uh, cities over in Europe, in Germany. In addition to that, there's the, the Smart City program in Minnesota. So, so more and more cities are kind of picking up the mantle on this and. Uh, and just doing little things. I, I think of the city of Warren, for instance, a small little city. What are they doing? They're actually partnering with the uh, th college at Three Fervor Falls, and they're flying drones over houses looking at uh, the insulation in houses and, and using that then with homeowners, uh, allowing them to decide whether they want to do anything about it. But it's a motivational kind of thing. But small little things, and all this is, it's, it's a million little steps, but uh, everyone counts. Uh, according to a recent report by Bloomberg New Energy Finance, coal remains the leading energy source in Minnesota, although renewable energy sources are second and ahead of nuclear power generation. To move Minnesota away from fossil fuel sources entirely, should Minnesota lift the ban on nuclear facilities so that more nuclear power can be generated for the state? Yeah, I don't think, uh, I think our nuclear uh, plants in Minnesota are due to actually uh, sunset in 2030 and 2033, the other one. Uh, there's two of them. Uh, and and I, don't, I don't believe XL Energy is looking at all towards advancing any more nuclear power in Minnesota, as far as we know. As a matter of fact, their CEO the other day just uh, uh, set as a goal, I think 2030, 85% renewable energy from XL Energy. So 
That, I think, tells me and a lot of other people what the direction of uh, XL Energy is, at least with respect to uh, moving away from nuclear power. It's, it's, it's very expensive to, to not necessarily retrofit, but to even repair these, update them, and so on and so forth. And there's the, 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 uh, the waste uh, issue as, as in addition to that. So I think, uh, well, I would favor lifting that ban personally. Uh, I have no problems with it. I've, I've been on bills that do that. But uh, I don't think that's probably the direction our state's going or XL Energy is going. Well, I'm, I'm curious because yeah. investment gurus always talk about having a diversified portfolio with all of your money in different pools. And I'm just wondering from an energy perspective, does it still make sense that we as a state would want to have some fossil fuel, some nuclear energy, and then a variety of renewable energy sources to kind of have a balanced portfolio um, of energy sources? Or are we really wanting, in your view, to move the state towards almost as much renewable as possible? Yeah. I would say this, there, there, there's a political move, to whether you like it or not, to, to move away from coal. I mean, it's, coal is dirty, you know, so to speak, and uh, it's hard to make clean coal. Uh, so you can maybe set that one aside. You've got natural gas, and, and yes, we've got natural gas, and we're fracking, and we've got, you know, uh, we've got some gas. Last I looked, 188 years worth. I don't think we can rely on that as, you know, the indefinite future in terms of energy. So, so what is left, and, and what is left is renewables. And one that I haven't mentioned yet is, uh, in which we learned about not only in Germany, but more recently at a, at a state legislative conference, is, is hydrogen. Uh, the idea of uh, actually making hydrogen out of water through electrolysis, uh, solar power electrolysis, uh, produces this renewable hydrogen. And it's a powerful, of course, uh, uh, propellant from the standpoint of being able to move engines and, and things like this. So. I think there's a there's a whole new future out there in terms of uh, what our energy is where our energy is going to come from. It's probably not going to be on coal or, or nuclear power. Uh, and natural gas, I don't think we're going to get rid of it. I think we need it as a, a backstop for a while. But uh, I think come back in 50 years and our energy is going to look a lot different than it does today. One more question is just about the financing of all of this because you know a lot of people watch their budgets and they don't you know how much we spend on energy maybe was something we'd like to not spend more than we need to. So bes besides the environmental benefits, will a, a greater reliance on renewables will that be cost effective over time? I, I think as we move into it, and even Excel will tell you right now uh, the cheapest kilowatt they can they can buy or they can produce is is a renewable kilowatt, uh, much uh, much cheaper than coal or nuclear power at this point. So uh, that, I think, is going to be our, our future. And then anything that comes beyond uh, wind and solar will, will also be our future. So uh, will it cost more? I, I don't think so. I think it will balance out. And uh, those, those costs will, I think, be generally consistent to, to what they are now. Senator Stenjum, I always love having you. Thank you so much. Oh, it's nice to be here. Thank you. Governor Mark Dayton and energy officials recently announced that clean energy jobs are outpacing other employment sectors in Minnesota. I'm thrilled to share that Minnesota once again was a bright spot in the Midwest with over 59,000 clean energy jobs in existence today. This represents an increase of over 1,500 jobs or 2.6% growth from 2016 to the end of 2017. Jobs in clean energy grew two times faster than overall job growth in the state. Clean energy jobs in Minnesota also grew second fastest among the 12 state Midwest region and clean energy employers are projecting to add 2,700 jobs in the next year, a growth rate of 4.6%. The message that I would like to send is that the diversity that's available today in terms of jobs is a lot different than it was 20 years ago when Blattner first got into the renewable energy industry. Back then, it was engineers, it was manufacturing, it was contractors building these projects. Today, it's technology driven, it's business driven. It, there's, there's a whole um, bigger picture of, of, of jobs available in this industry. <music> Four stately Civil War statues enhance the grandeur of the Capitol Rotunda's grand floor. Capitol historian Brian Pease describes their important contributions. 
Capitol architect Cass Gilbert designed the second floor of the Capitol Rotunda with four alcoves to be filled at a later date, and they have been filled with statues of Civil War heroes. Can you tell us about the first one that comes to mind? Yeah, the, the second floor niches were designed in Cass Gilbert's mind to be for senators or famous presidents from Minnesota and so forth, and these became the second generation of Civil War art is the statues. And so one very prominent uh, statue you'll see in the second floor is William Colville, who was a colonel from the 1st Minnesota Infantry. And his role, his claim to fame was leading the men of the 1st Minnesota at the charge at Gettysburg where they lost 82 percent of their men. He was wounded twice there, and so it was one of those things that he survived those wounds, became one of the renowned war heroes of Minnesota, and uh, became an attorney general after the war. He also served in the House of Representatives. He was like a land commissioner up in northeastern Minnesota, and so there's a little township, or a little town, Colville, it's called, and um, that's part of his legacy. But he lived in Red Wing, so that's where he uh, was coming to St. Paul, Minneapolis and St. Paul, for the big grand day celebration of the flags being moved from the second capital to the brand new capital. So he was going to be one of the guests of honor. And he uh, was staying at the veterans home in Minneapolis, which was not uncommon for veterans to find a place to stay when they're in the Twin Cities. And he passed away in his sleep two days before that big event took place. And he was the first to be laid in state in the state capital. That's correct. He was the first uh, person in Minnesotan to be laid in state in the capital. And it was a very poignant part of that uh, remembrance of the, uh, you know, the flag bearers and the Civil War veterans and those flags being brought to the capital. But his body was in state right in the center of the rotunda. And so those flag bearers, as they marched into the building, you know, marched by his casket as part of that final tribute to this great war hero. Alexander Wilkin, why was he here and why is he the only one of the four statues to have the, the tree stump with the oak leaves next to him? Yeah, he was one of the highest ranking officers from the state of Minnesota to be killed in the Civil War. So the symbolism of that cut down oak tree is that in cemeteries or it's, uh, it's often referring to a man who was cut down in his prime. Just like the strong oak is cut down, you know, you have this loss, this, you know, tremendous strength and authority that's disappeared because of that death. Alexander Wilkin was from St. Paul, an attorney. He was a U.S. Marshal here. He also was one of the first sec secretaries of the territory from the early 1850s, 1851 to 1853. And so he had established himself here as a, a pretty strong St. Paul resident, was a landowner and so forth. He started the um, uh, an insurance company that what eventually became, became Travelers, Travelers yes. Insurance Company yes. today. And so that's, he's the father and, you know, the, the creator of that, that uh, big corporation. And then you also have Wilkin County was named in honor of him to remember his Civil War uh, sacrifice as a Minnesotan in that war. John Sanborn both began his career and ended his career in state politics, first as a member of the House and Senate. He was one of the first legislators to write the laws for the state and then went back into politics at the end of his career and fought in the Civil War in between. Talk more about John Sanborn. Yeah, he was a pretty interesting uh, person in St. Paul's history. He was a lawyer, uh, had a pretty strong established firm. He, was, in fact, had already by the time of the Civil War had addressed the Supreme Court in four different cases. So people were asking him for his services. He became a state senator. When the war began was given the responsibility to be the adjutant general. So it was his job to organize all of the Minnesota units that were going to be sent out to fight in the Civil War. So he raised the first four infantry regiments. He put a you know a couple of uh, artillery units together, cavalry units. So there were 11 units that he had helped you know, armed, equipped, trained at Fort Snelling to send out to fight. And eventually, because of his role in doing that, he was given the colonelcy, or becoming the, the leader, the commander of the 4th Minnesota Infantry. I read that he was well respected by many tribal leaders. They called him Black Whiskers, and along with Kit Carson, he was responsible for negotiating some treaties. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. They, they were some peace councils and some treaties that he was a part of in the 1860s, 1867 and 68. So he, uh, served in the military after the Civil War for several years and what's remarkable remarkable about him is he was as we mentioned a, a state senator and a house member and a pretty well-known attorney in the, in the city but if you go to his grave in Oakland Cemetery in St. Paul you'll see 
and this big monument of his, it's General Sanborn. So I think that was something he was very proud of throughout his life serving in the Civil War. He served before he died as the president of the Minnesota Historical Society. We have a lot of his Civil War accoutrements and equipment that he donated to the museum. And so once again, his legacy is important in the state capitol because of his role in the Civil War. Let's turn to Major General James Shields, who had a storied history. He was born in Ireland, and he served as a U.S. Senator from three different states. How, what, what are some other highlights of his career? Yeah, his statue was placed here, the last of the four statues in 1914, and his claim to Minnesota's fame is he was our first U.S. Senator along with Henry Rice. So in that, at that time, you have to remember that those senators were elected from the legislative bodies and state state houses or state capitals and so he um, was not the favorite candidate but they couldn't decide they didn't get enough votes to swing one candidate above the other and so they brought him as kind of a dark horse candidate a kind of a compromise candidate and he became our first senator he only served for about a year and then he was active all over the place so he before he came to minnesota was a, a supreme court justice in illinois was their state auditor and didn't he challenge Abraham Lincoln to a duel, and what's the story behind that? Yeah, in 1842, uh, this young up-and-coming legislator from Illinois, Abraham Lincoln, was, and they think Mary Todd might have also had a, a role in that, they were writing scathing editorials in the newspaper in Springfield, uh, besmirching the credibility and the, the ability of James Shields, and so Shields wanted to have the satisfaction of knowing who was sending these editorials in the paper and he eventually finds out it was Abraham Lincoln. So he challenged Abraham Lincoln to a duel. And because Lincoln was challenged, he got to choose his weapons, and the weapon was broadswords. And so they actually went to Missouri, because they couldn't duel legally in Illinois, to fight this duel. And at the last minute, the second stepped in and canceled that, that, that uh, duel. So and then they became friends, correct? They beca yeah, they, they had, a, I don't know if they were like, come on over for supper <laughs> kind of friends, but they had a you know, professional respect and a mutual respect after that time. And, so. and I believe also for his service in a prior war, the Mexican-American War, he was awarded land in Minnesota and he established the town of Shieldsville and also was responsible for bringing a lot of Irish immigrants from the East Coast to Minnesota. Right, that, and that was the reason why he was here when Minnesota was becoming a state. He had established these small Irish immigrant communities, helped establish Faribault, Minnesota. So he was you know, a pretty well-known person. You mentioned that Cass Gilbert had designed these niches to be used for state senators or other people of state importance, and yet they were filled with Civil War heroes. Would he have approved of that? Yeah, he, he was alive when this took place, and I haven't seen a lot of information or letters he was saying that's the worst idea ever, but I think he, you know, he had envisioned something different than what we have. But once again, it gives you the, the idea of the importance of the Civil War when this building opened. This is only one decade removed from when this building opened that these statues were all placed here. And so once again, it's really us being able to tell that story of what this building was about. Not only are the laws made here, but you have this important part of our story of Minnesota's involvement in the Civil War throughout the entire state capitol building. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.